All right, sixth period. Um, this is the fire drill lesson. I'm gonna try and do this as quick as we can uh, to help you guys out here. Um, the star of the Tang Dynasty is this gentleman. He is a 16-year-old, already famous warrior, war hero, when he takes power. His dad started the unification process of the Tang Dynasty, but it's named for him. He chooses the name Tang Tai Zong, which means great general. And while Tang was mainly a military guy, a, a conqueror, he was also educated in the Confucian classics. And one of the things he was committed to was reforming the Chinese government, getting them back to where they were on their game. And as a result, in the upper tier of great, like what they call the Mount Rushmore, you know, we've got, you know, Washington and Lincoln and Roosevelt. Well, Tang Tai Zong would be in China's Mount Rushmore. He's that powerful. He's that good. One of the best emperors in China's long, vast history. Now, Tang decided to intentionally keep the policy started in the Han Dynasty of empire building. Right? The strength of any dynasty or emperor was measured or gauged on how far you expanded the empire. So Tang goes west into what is today Afghanistan. He goes farther east, deeper into Korea, and down into Southeast Asia. Today's Vietnam, Laos, and um, Cambodia. And while he was a conqueror, Tang does something rather unique. Rather than just come in and military conquer and bludgeon his way to power, Tang brought a lot of the Chinese wealth, their food, um, different types, their technological ideas, silk. And he brought it and he displayed it to those he was going to conquer. He hoped that the wealth and the power and the technology that he displayed would allow many people in China or the people in Afghanistan, Southeast Asia to just surrender, become part of his empire, be absorbed into his empire. If you did, he let you keep your own local customs and your own local government. You just acknowledged Tang as your king and paid him either taxes or tribute. If you joined willingly, you were good. If not, then as always, he would militarily conquer you and take you over. Now, we have, after Tang, we have another unique thing, and you're probably not going to hear about this lady um, too much, but as we go um, into China, in this era of history, it's one of the most patriarchal, male-dominated societies of all time. So what makes it unique is we have this um, female emperor. Her name is Wu Zhao. Um, having a ruling empress um, or a queen is strange for many of the patriarchal societies at the time. But Wu is a functional woman ruler, like a Theodora to Justinian or to Hatshepsut back in, in ancient Egypt. Um, Wu is one of the organizers behind the idea to help rebuild what worked. And she said, you know, when the Han Dynasty was on top of its game, this is what it did. This is when it was at its most functional. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's just simply do what they did. Let's pick the best parts and then try and copy it. And one of the best things the Han did was their efficient governmental structure based solely on the Confucian scholars. Those advisors to the emperor schooled in the Confucian classics. So Wu's idea was to help open a school for a Confucian school in every town and village. The idea is, through this Confucian education, to get the people to be able to function for themselves. We don't always have to do it for them. If we show them how to do it, let them practice it, and let them go off on their own. So the Confucian schools are revived, as is once again using the Confucian civil service exam. And as a result, once again magically, the Tang government runs smoothly. And one of the other things the Tang did 
was redistribute land to needy peasants. We've got these large landowners, all right, who have more than they need, and peasants are working, but you only are truly motivated when you're going to get something out of it. If you don't own it, then why are you going to work so hard at it, all right? So over here, we have Colin. We talked about Colin's room where it was kind of mostly clean, and Mother Libe says, oh, Colin, go clean your room, and he has like his baseball clothes here and the semi-clean clothes here, and he fixes his quilt. And that's like a Chinese peasant working for a large landlord. But ding dong, the doorbell rings. And there's an AP world test. And who shows up at the Libe household but nice young Christina? Colin is halfway through, like taking some mostly dirty laundry, you know, to the hamper, and he hears Christina's voice, and all of a sudden, his mom sees a flash, like Barry Allen running up and down the stairs, there's a vacuum cleaner, there's Febreze, there's a dust mop, there's Windex, and all of a sudden, the entire house is sparkling clean, because Colin chose to do it. He took ownership of it. Well, the Tang Dynasty says, if we give more land to the peasants, they'll be motivated. They will take ownership. It'll make them more productive. And this weakens the nobles. But the Tang government doesn't really, doesn't really care because he gets a lot of support from the, the, the peasants. And at this time, the land ownership system was very similar to feudalism in Japan. It was similar to feudalism in Europe, large wealthy landowners exploiting, ex exploiting excuse me, the um, peasants. But now that we're working for ourselves, you begin to collect skilled labor. You need a blacksmith. You need a butcher. You need a candle maker. And these people begin to set up shop, and they begin to form little towns. And towns become collections of skilled labor. And skilled laborers make money. And the emperor likes it because the more these little towns grow up, the more tax money he can get. These changes allow the emperor to collect additional taxes. With an added source of revenue, the emperor needs the nobles less, and he gains even more power. This is the same thing that happens not only in, in China, the similar thing is going to happen in Europe at the end of the High Middle Ages. And to facilitate some extra um, growth, the Tang kind of, you know, perform what they call laissez-faire capitalism, hands off, no controls. And one of the things they do is they begin to build the Grand Canal, linking the Huangho with the Yangtze River. Um, this allows access, the northern part of China now has access to the southern part of China. Both regions have different products that others need or can use, but there's no way efficiently to ship them over land. But the Grand Canal is dug. It is the largest canal dug with pure human labor. And now we can transport large sums or large, you know, bought packages of goods and services back and forth. Here's a real bizarre analogy. Up in Vermont, they make really super good maple syrup. Comes out of the maple trees in the springtime. Way down in the south, right, South Carolina and Georgia, they make peaches. And I love some peaches. And so do the people of South Carolina and Georgia. But you know who else may like peaches? People in Vermont, but they can't get them. And down in South Carolina, Georgia, God, on my pancakes, I'd really like some really good Vermont maple syrup, but we don't have maple trees, so we can't do it. And all of a sudden, the Grand Canal is dug. And they say, you know what may really taste good? Take some maple syrup and put them on peaches, kind of sweet and savory, like I'm on the Food Network or Chopped or something like that. And now with the Grand Canal, we can send a large bunch of maple syrup down to South Carolina and Georgia and a bunch of peaches up to Vermont. It's a simplistic analogy, but that's what the Grand Canal does. You can't take it out on the ocean, you can't take it over land, but you can do it on the Grand Canal.
And so everything is working extremely well. Here's a little photo, I believe, of the Grand Canal coming up right here, linking the two rivers. Um, but all good things must come to an end. And as we've seen time and time and time again in Chinese history, some emperors were simply not as effective as others. Um, others um, were just simply greedy. They didn't pay attention. They were born into wealth. They didn't understand the hard work and the back-breaking labor it took to get there. They were born and everything was running smoothly. All they had to do was keep an eye on it and maintain it. But the last five times I went to check on it, things are working smoothly. Why well, think that the next one's going to be any different? So they don't go and they don't check on it and things begin to fall apart. People forgot the hard work it took to be successful. To them, that's the way it always was. And they're greedy. They're worried about an opulent lifestyle, bigger palace, more friends, nicer clothes, more lavish parties. And all of it takes money. And if you remember back in the Han Dynasty, how did the Han Dynasty purchase something? Exactly, Peyton. They waited till they had the money for it. When they had the cash in hand, they went and bought it. They didn't do it on credit. Well, these late Tang emperors can't control themselves. Their spending habits are out of control, so they need more money, so they increase the taxes on their people. Near the end, some of these emperors really pushed and imposed heavy taxes, so the far-reaching borders of their empire, back where Jessica is, um, over here where Colin is, back where Sheila is sitting, those are the borders of my empire. They're so far away, if they resist my taxes, it's going to take me a long time to get there. So they slowly begin to lose people on the borders of their empire, especially in the West. Then all of a sudden, a new invader comes. Islamic armies are spreading from Central Asia over into China. And some of those Islamic armies are Mongols. They're Mongol Muslims. And I need Colin, and I need Sheila, and I need Jessica to keep them at bay. But now that they're angry, not only do they not stop some of the reinvading Mongols, some say, hey, you're going to get the emperor? Well, I'll join you. I'll show you the way. Come on and follow me. So <clears throat> this um, attack from also the age-old Mongols are back. The normal, we'll call them Mongol Mongols. We have Muslim Mongols coming in. And the Tang Dynasty is in trouble. To further complicate matters, there's a period of severe famine where no food grows, and it's intensified by a series of deep, desperate droughts. And the Tang Dynasty simply can't handle all of these problems. And the Tang Dynasty was a great but very brief dynasty. It helped bring reunification back to China. The people saw the Mongols invading, the famine, and the drought as signs that the gods wanted them to rebel. The gods encouraged them to rebel. The last time we saw this many problems, what happened to the emperor? We killed him and we, and we ate the guy. You guys remember Wang Mang? Everybody have fun tonight. Everybody eat some Wang Mang tonight. Well, it wasn't that bad this time, but it was pretty bad. Luckily for China, after the Tang Dynasty falls, the period in between dynasties is relatively short. It doesn't last that long. And the next dynasty comes in, the Song Dynasty, which lasts from 960, kind of the middle of the, the Dark Ages of Europe, up to the beginning of the Renaissance. And the Song become very, very smart about what they do. Their dynasty lasts a little shorter than the Tang dynasty, but also the Song stood and looked. The Han dynasty fell because it expanded too big. The Tang dynasty fell because it got too big. Well, the Roman Empire fell because it got too big. The Tang dynasty made the conscious, or the, excuse me, the Song made the conscious decision to decrease the size of their empire. 
to consolidate it, to make it more efficient, to kind of fall back. Let's make ourselves smaller so we're protected and we can manage everything. They do this in, in, intentionally. There was the, the threat of the renewed Mongols coming back. And the Mongols are going to keep coming back and back and back. And the Islamic spread. So the, the Song are going to be like, okay, let's just hang on to what we have and protect it. And when the Song do this, they have an idea or, or things that symbolize their dynasty are creativity and artistic and technological invention. And one of the things that makes the song powerful, besides decreasing the size of the empire, they make a switch in farming. The crop previous to this was growing wheat, all right, W-H-E-A-T. And you harvest the wheat, and you take it, and you grind um, the grain into flour to bake bread. And that's good, but wheat takes a lot of maintenance. It needs sun and it needs water and if anything bad happens you starve. Well the song began to really push for the spread of a new crop and that is growing rice where you can flood a certain area of land and then let it go. It doesn't require as much maintenance and perfect growing conditions like wheat. Also if you've ever cooked you take a handful of rice and you throw it in a pot of water, what happens to the rice? Bam! It expands like my stomach. So a little bit of rice will feed many more people. So can you see like the UN or US Army, when we take disaster relief food to third world countries or, or places like that, it's usually 100 pound bags of rice because 100 pounds of rice will feed a lot of people. And so when rice replaces wheat, there's an increase in irrigation techniques to keep the rice watered. And all of a sudden, the Chinese are able to grow and harvest two crops a year instead of one. More food equals what? That's right. More people. More people equates to a population boom. And with that not having to struggle growing wheat all the time, the Song have more free time. And they're able to develop new ideas in commerce, in their economy, in art, architecture, and other cultural achievements. So the Song Dynasty, think of Song shortened the empire or consolidated the empire, but they spend their time on creativity, on art, because the Song were smart. All right? That is the focus of the Song Dynasty. Not as big, but very brilliant. And the Song encouraged trading. The Song Empire becomes a vast trading empire as merchants are going to arrive from all parts of the world practically. Some come overland via the land route Silk Road. Others come across the Indian Ocean on ships as far away as India, the Middle East, and parts of East Africa on ships known as Chinese junks, like, hey, that's a hunk of junk but it was a Chinese ship. Um, previous Chinese technology helped out. One thing was the development of the compass. It really helps to know where you're going, north, south, east, and, and west. There's the stern post rudder, which allowed the Chinese to more easily navigate. This encouraged sea trade. You can carry a lot more cargo a lot faster and a lot safer on the water than you can over land. And we have found Song artifacts, Song porcelain, as far away as the east coast of Africa. So either there was direct trade between East Africa and China, or goods were distributed. There was indirect trade over the Indian Ocean or Silk Road trade routes, which we'll talk about later in the week. So as a result, during this time, China enjoys just a unprecedented era of cultural diffusion. Goods and ideas and products are being traded back and forth. The outside traders were revered. They were seen as awesome and necessary and welcomed into China when Chinese merchants were still seen as bad. Chinese merchants were very rich but it didn't really matter. They were new money. Ask me about that tomorrow, and I will explain that 
um, concept to you. And as a result, the Chinese are the first country to have several cities of a population of one million. That we know of at this time, ancient Rome was the only city to have a documented population of one million, but it was only one. China has several. And I compare the Chinese East Coast to the American East Coast, where you, know, you have Boston, um, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia. Working your way down the coast, we have several large cities. Well, China is the same way. There's a bunch of large cities there, and the population, several cities, are over a million. They were the only country in the world at the time with this ability. And I think it does a great job of demonstrating the power, the efficiency, and the wealth of ancient China. Now, while that's great and new and innovative, some things we are simply just not going to change. What isn't broke, don't fix it. And so the Song Society kept true to its basic social structure. Um, there were three groups of people in society. On top is the emperor and his buddies, the rich guys. Right? Second tier are um, <clears throat> the um, peasants. Right? Peasants are going to work very hard, very long hours. It's like 80%, 80 to 85% of the people. The emperor and the nobles, 5%. The bottom 5% are merchants. While they were rich, while they were wealthy, people really still didn't like them very much. That's where we're going to stop. The leaf blower is driving me crazy. And we will finish up the saying, the, excuse me, the Song Dynasty tomorrow very quickly. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll talk to you and see you soon.